Hi there, this is Brad Chamberlain. I'm the technical lead of the Chapel project at Cray and HPE, and this is a quick introduction to Chapel for those who are new to the language. If you're not familiar with Chapel, it's a modern parallel programming language. It's portable and scalable, and by that we mean it can run on laptops, commodity clusters, the cloud, or supercomputers. And it's an open source and collaborative project. It's hosted on GitHub, and it's distributed under the Apache 2.0 license. Two high-level goals of Chapel are to support general parallel programming. You can think of that as the ability to take any parallel algorithm you have in mind, write it in Chapel, and then write it on any parallel hardware. The second is to make parallel programming at scale far more productive than it is today. Now, this term productivity is kind of a loaded term. It tends to mean different things to different people. And just to give a few examples, um, if you talk to a recent uh, graduate or maybe somebody who's still a student, oftentimes what you'll hear is that productivity to them is similar to what they learned in school. And these days that can often be something like Python or MATLAB or Java. When you talk to a seasoned HPC programmer, you sort of get this response like, that's that sugary stuff I don't really need because I was born to suffer. And that's sort of tongue in cheek, but what they really mean is that they want full control over their system in order to ensure that they get the performance that it's capable of delivering. When we talk to computational scientists, often what they want is something that lets them focus on their science and the perils and that's inherent in their science without having to wrestle with lots of architecture specific details. And if you ask those of us on the chapel team, our answer is that it's something that lets computational scientists express what they want, yet without taking away the control that HPC programmers want, all implemented in the language that's as attractive as recent graduates would want. Now, another way to think about chapel is to compare it to other languages. And so we're trying to create a language that's as programmable as Python, meaning it's as easy to read and write code uh, as, as a lot of people find Python to be. Yet uh, something that delivers scalar code that's as fast as Fortran, um, code that scales up to large scale systems as well as MPI or SHMEM or UPC do, which are three conventional ways of programming supercomputers. Something that's as portable as C, will basically run anywhere. And as flexible as C++ in the sense of being able to create your own types and operator overloads and sort of extend the language within the language. And the last bullet here is we want Chapel to be as fun as your favorite programming language. And that may seem a little bit silly, um, but I think a lot of people get into programming because they think programming is fun. Yet in the HPC arena, high performance computing arena, uh, programming is often not that fun. And what we'd like to do is make programming pleasurable again, rather than something you just have to grit your teeth and get through. Now, we're not the only ones who think new languages are worthwhile. This is a slide from a keynote that Kathy Yellick uh, from Berkeley gave at our annual workshop in 2018. And she was arguing in that talk that languages matter more than ever due to architectural changes that are taking place. And she pointed out that four big things that languages can give you are better syntax, better semantics, and checks on those semantics, um, better performance, because the compiler might be able to optimize things better, and the ability to write better algorithms because languages influence the way we think. Um, these are points we agree with and are a lot of the reasons that we are developing Chapel. This is an outline of this talk. I've just given you a little bit of context and motivation for Chapel. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about productivity using some examples um, showing both sort of the clean code that Chapel can relate, result in, as well as the performance that it can generate. Then I'll give you a very quick tour of some Chapel features and I'll wrap up with a summary and some resources to find out more. So I'm gonna start out with just about the simplest parallel computation I can think of. This is a benchmark called Stream Triad. The idea is that you're given three vectors and you're gonna multiply one of the vectors C times a scalar alpha, add that to a second vector B and assign it to a third vector A. And if you've done any parallel computing at all, you know that this can be trivially parallelized simply by chunking up the vectors and giving each of your tasks a portion of each of the vectors, and it can compute its subset of A based on its subset of B and C without really interacting with any of the other tasks at all. And this picture I've drawn here is essentially a shared memory execution of this, where all of the tasks are running on their portion of the vector, but they're all sharing that alpha scalar. Now, if we're running in distributed memory, we change the picture slightly. We'd give each of the tasks its own copy of alpha, so it wouldn't have to communicate across the network to get at that value of alpha. And of course, today most parallel machines are a combination of distributed and shared memory due to multi-core processors. 
So we'd have sort of a combination of the two where each compute node would have its own copy of alpha, but then it would chunk up its portion of the vector across the cores that it owns locally. Now, if we write this in MPI, the code looks like this. Um, the MPI code is in red, and there's not very much of it because this is a fairly simple code. So we just have a little bit related to um, set up and tear down. The computational loop itself is in green down in the bottom right. And the rest of the code is more or less C boilerplate in black. Now, if we want to make that hybrid shared memory and distributed memory code, one of the ways we can do that is to mix in OpenMP. And we can annotate these loops as being parallel uh, using these pragmas. So now we have a code that's hybrid distributed memory and shared memory can scale up to very large um, computers. But the thing to note is that we use very, very different syntax and notation and concepts between the shared memory programming and the distributed memory programming. This is the kind of thing that Chapel aims to improve upon. So if we look at that same code in Chapel, um, this is what it looks like. I've elided just a few short expressions here um, because you might want to plug different things into them. But by and large, it's sort of these very simple lines of code. And you notice it's much shorter and sweeter than the C code that we were just looking at. And a lot of that is by virtue of the fact that it's a more modern language and we've taken advantage of a lot of modern language design principles. And the other part of it is that parallelism and locality are built into Chapel. So we can express things that are more complex to say in C more trivially. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about this code, and it relates to those expressions that I've left out, is that this code could be run serially or shared memory parallel, distributed memory parallel, um, the combination of shared and distributed memory that we've been talking about, or any one of a number of other mappings down to a uh, machine's memory and processors. And all of that choice between those different implementations is um, that expression that I elided here and the one at the top in the use statement, um, which basically says, how should these indices and the arrays declared over these indices and the computations over those arrays be mapped down to the system? And by plugging different expressions in there, uh, I can get completely different behaviors for this code just by changing that one little declaration. And this is something we'll come back to later on in the talk, but it's a big, um, design principle in Chapel, that you can write your code once and then map it down to the system in different kinds of ways without going and changing every single line. Now, of course, being a short code is nice, but if it isn't fast, then it probably doesn't matter if you're a parallel uh, computational scientist. So the good thing is that Chapel not only is succinct, but it also results in very good performance. So here what we have is a performance graph where we're adding compute nodes, which we call locales in Chapel uh, along the x-axis. And then performance is shown on the y-axis. So as we add nodes, we hope to get better and better performance. And you can see that this goes out to about 18,000 cores uh, at the very top here. And I'm plotting Chapel in blue against the reference MPI plus OpenMP version I showed you in green. And you can see they're essentially neck and neck. And in fact, they can compete identically. The reason there's a little bit of a gap here is that with Chapel, we typically run with huge pages on. Uh, MPI and OpenMP typically run with huge pages off. And so we ran each in its preferred environment, and that results in this slight gap. But if we change them so they're both running with huge pages on or off, in fact, these lines would be essentially identical to one another. Now let's look at a slightly more interesting example. This is a benchmark called Random Access. It's part of the HPC Challenge benchmark suite. And the idea here is that we have a distributed table across all of our compute nodes, which I'm showing here with those dotted purple lines. And what we're going to do is do a bunch of random updates to this table to random locations in the table with random numbers in parallel. And so each one of our tasks or processors is going to be running simultaneously, computing these random numbers, and going and updating that table location in parallel. And sometimes we may get a conflict, like you can see this one here, where two things are updating simultaneously. And you have kind of two choices in this benchmark. You can either do a lossless version, where you don't drop any of those updates on the floor, or sometimes there is a version that allows you to uh, lose some updates. And here we're going to focus on the lossless version just because it's slightly more interesting. Now, again, we'll start out by looking at a reference version. This is the MPI code uh, written um, in C. And again, I've highlighted the MPI uh, calls themselves in red. And you can see there are a lot more of them here than in stream. And that's because this is a more complex computation. There's actually communication taking place. So there's the need to exchange data. Um, if we zoom in on the first few lines of this computation, we see a comment which explains what the three columns of code are doing sort of more simplistically, right? So conceptually, we're just doing a bunch of random updates to the table is what this comment's saying. Now, if we look at the main loop in the chapel code, 
um, it's these two lines here, basically saying, uh, for all the updates we want to do in parallel and all the random numbers associated with those updates, update the table using an XOR operation. Uh, and as you can see, the kernel of the chapel code is essentially about the same line, sorry, the same amount of code as the MPI code itself. So again, another example of getting succinct code. And this time when we look at performance, again, this is a uh, performance chart, so higher is better. And you can see that in this case, the chapel version is uh, dramatically outperforming the MPI code. And you might ask why this is. Um, and the reason is that what we've done here is express to the compiler in the simplest terms possible, do a ton of random updates to random memory locations. And the compiler can basically look at that and map that down to uh, a very efficient implementation. In this case, we've implemented it on a Cray, and the Cray has atomic memory updates in uh, the network. And so the compiler could say, well, I'm just going to basically blast as many of those atomic updates across the network as possible, as quickly as possible, and then I'll synchronize at the end. If we look at the MPI code, you might hope that maybe a compiler could do the same thing, but there's so much more detail here, and it's so much more explicit about how things should be done, not simply what should be done, that in my opinion, it's going to be very, very difficult for a compiler to ever automatically get the same kind of performance that we're getting with chapel code. So returning to Kathy Yellick's slide, this is an example where good syntax has allowed the programmer to write the code more simply, and it's also exposed to the compiler more straightforwardly what the code should be doing, and that allows the compiler to get better performance. Okay, so I think a good example for why languages can be beneficial in parallel computing. Now, we study a lot of different patterns and benchmarks. I've shown you two here, stream triad at the lower left and random access at the upper right. And these express some key patterns in HPC, um, embarrassing or pleasing parallelism in the case of stream triad and global updates to random memory in the case of random access. But there are a lot of other computational patterns that are key. And so over time, we look at um, as many as we have time for and as users uh, uh, ask us to look into. And so I've shown just some other uh, examples here and um, of different patterns. The patterns are expressed within these rectangles and the names of the benchmarks that are representing them outside of the rectangles. And then if I remove those labels, um, you can see some graphs here. And there's obviously a lot of detail here, a lot we could go through. But the main takeaway is that Chapel is generally, for these benchmarks, competing with the reference versions or beating them. And that means that Chapel is not only a nice, clean, succinct language, but that you can get great performance from it as well. OK? Um, if you'd like more information about Chapel performance, uh, there's a link here at the bottom of the slide on our web page. Um, it has some of these performance charts that we've talked about here and a little bit of detail about them. And we'll be building out more detail on this page as time goes on. Uh, you can also send us questions if you have any. I want to point out that what we've talked about so far are fairly simple benchmarks and kernels, but I want to call out um, six of the most notable current applications of Chapel that are going on uh, and where they're taking place. And I'm not going to read through each one of these individually, but just to point out that some of them are what you'd call sort of traditional scientific simulations of physical phenomena. Um, other ones are more data oriented. So looking at graph analysis or um, large arrays representing databases and things like that. Um, if you'd like any more information about any of these projects, uh, the link at the bottom of the slide here takes you to a Powered by Chapel page on the Chapel website, which gives a bit more detail about each of these, as well as how you can find out more about them. Needless to say, uh, a lot of the reasons that these users have ended up using Chapel for their applications are similar to the kinds of things I've been saying. They find it uh, a nice language in terms of readability and writability, and they find that they're getting the performance that they would like to out of it, most of the time. And when they don't, they let us know and we help them improve it. All right, so with that, I want to take you to the next section of the talk. And what I'm going to do is talk to you a bit about some of Chapel's features and illustrate them through some simple sample programs. Now, this is going to be a very high level introduction to Chapel. There's a lot more detail we could go into um, if we had more time. Uh, but for today, I just want to give you enough to give you the context you might need to understand some of the talks you might hear at Chew later on this week. So whenever I talk about Chapel and its feature set, I tend to use this little diagram. I think of the language features as separating into these five little rectangles. And uh, you can think of some of them as being lower level and closer to the target machine, and others are being higher level. But even the low level features most people find are reasonably high level um, compared to standard practice for parallel programming anyway. 
Um, so let's start with lower level chapel and let's start specifically with the base language. And you can think of the base language for chapel as being, if you took chapel and removed all the features related to parallelism and all of the features related to scalability, what would you be left with? So you can think of it as the serial language which chapel is based on, except that rather than basing on an existing language, we started from scratch. And my base language example is going to be a Fibonacci computation. Um, so not, not anything particularly complicated, but just a familiar pattern people might be familiar with to exhibit some of the features. And I'll mention that this example and all of these examples are complete chapel programs. You could type this code into your favorite editor, save it and compile it with chapel. And if I haven't made any mistakes, it'll compile and run. So I haven't left out a lot of details or anything like that. All right, now, as I said, this is a Fibonacci computation. On the left, I have a Fibonacci iterator that's gonna compute the Fibonacci sequence. And on the right, I have an invocation of it. Let me call out these, uh, some of these features one by one. The first one I'm gonna note is what we call a configuration constant or a configurable declaration. And a bunch of Chapel's declaration styles support this config keyword. And what that does is it provides the ability to override its value as specified in the source file on the command line. So in this case, for example, I'm declaring constant n and I'm saying in the source of the code that it has the value 10. But what that gives me is an automatic command line flag that when I run my program, I can say dash dash n equals and give it a new value. And that'll override the value in the source text of the program if I choose to do that. So in this run, for example, I've changed it from the default of 10 to a million simply by specifying that on the command line. And again, that's enabled by this config keyword. The next thing I'm gonna point out is iterators. Um, so the whole code on the left is an iterator, and then we're invoking it on the right over here in this for loop. Um, iterators in Chapel are like what you might have seen in many other modern languages. Um, they're like procedures or functions that rather than returning a single value, they yield values back, but they continue executing until eventually you fall out of the routine or um, you return. So in this case, when I invoke this for f and fib of n, each of the values that's yielded on the left is bound to that index variable f for that loop iteration. Then after that loop iteration runs, we go back to the iterator, continue executing until we get to the next yield, or again, we fall out, in which case we exit the loop. So in this case, I'm passing in my value n. My Fibonacci iterator is going to loop n times. That's what that for i and one to n loop uh, is doing there. And each time it's gonna yield a value, it'll go back to the call site at f and be printed out. You may notice that this code doesn't have any type declarations in it. So I've declared n and my Fibonacci uh, uh, iterator and my local variables within there without saying anything about their types. Um, Chapel is a compiled and statically typed language. So all of these symbols do have a single well-defined type, but rather than having to express it all the time, the compiler can figure it out. So for example, it looks at the declaration of n and it says, well, I know that 10 is an integer, so therefore I know that n is an integer and you don't have to tell me that. And then it passes that integer to fib and it says, well, fib must take an integer. So n, its, our, its formal argument's gonna be an integer. And then it'll go in and see current and next are in, initialized with integers, so they're integers. And we yield current, so we're yielding integers, which means that f's an integer. And this type of information is flowed through the program symbolically during compilation time. And again, every symbol comes up with a unique static type as we compile the program. Now, I've chosen to leave the types off here both to show off the feature and because it makes the code a little bit shorter and simpler. But you can specify types in Chapel as well, and many times that's an important thing to do, like in a library interface, for example. So quickly, I'll show you what the code looks like if I've specified those types. Here I've used the colon syntax, which is how we specify types in Chapel, to say that each of these things I've um, declared implicitly before are in fact integers. And so um, this tells the compiler the types explicitly, enables a little bit more type checking at the procedure call sites. Um, but by and large, it's exactly the same code as before. It won't have any impact on um, execution time or really compile time either for that matter. All right, so let's go back to the simpler version before we go on. And next we're gonna change our loop slightly. So I started out here just calling the Fibonacci iterator by itself. Um, another way we often iterate in Chapel is using what we call zippered iteration. So this is iterating over multiple things simultaneously. And here, in addition to the Fibonacci iterator invocation, I've zipped in uh, what we call a little range expression. So we have ranges in Chapel, which are essentially regular sequences of integers. On the left, I've got one that counts from one to n. The one on the right says zero to n, and it uses that less than sign to give an open interval. So this is basically like zero to n minus one, just written in a slightly cuter way, if you will. 
Um, there are a bunch of other operators you can apply to ranges in order to slice and dice the sets of integers that they describe. Um, but today we'll just see some simple ones here. And then the last thing I want to show, I think it's the last thing, is that we have tuples in language. So we use these often when we want to use a small collection of variables, uh, either as a singleton or, um, or split apart. And in this case, the zippered iteration is going to yield tuples. And then I'm using the parentheses and the comma here to detuple that into the individual components i, which is my integer 0 to n minus 1, and then f, which is my Fibonacci number. And you can see I also changed the right line here when I introduced the zipper iteration to make the output slightly more interesting. I'm printing out both i and f now. And that's your brief introduction to some of the base language features and some of the basic concepts in Chapel. Now, the base language itself is huge. It's got everything you might want from modern language. So it's got object-oriented features. It's got features for generic programming, error handling, doing compile time metaprogramming, uh, creating modules, which are like our namespaces, our ways of organizing code, ways to do procedure overloading and filtering, a bunch of things related to passing arguments using name-based matches and default values and intents, and lots, lots more. So um, again, we could spend a whole day talking about the language, and you can almost spend a whole day talking about the base language. There's so much here. But again, it's got sort of all the features you would want and expect from a modern language. So with that, let's turn to some of the things that make Chapel a little bit more unique. We're going to look next at task parallelism and locality control, again, at the lower level of the language. So these are features that are related to expressing reasonably explicit control over the parallelism and scalability of your program. And then we'll jump up to the high level next. All right, so before I dive into that, I'm going to go back to a term I mentioned briefly earlier called locales. A locale in Chapel is essentially a piece of the target architecture that can run tasks and store variables. And typically, it's pretty safe to think of a locale as being a compute node, uh, either just your whole laptop, for example, or if you're running on a cluster or a supercomputer, one of the compute nodes on that machine. And when you run a Chapel program, you specify the number of locales you want to run on on the command line at least if you've compiled for multiple locales. And so here, for example, I'm saying, let's run my program on four locales. And there's a shorthand version you can say dash NL for num locales. And this says, when I run my program, it should go out and request the four compute nodes from the system and then run on those four compute nodes. And the one last thing you need to know here is that when you start running a chapel program, the entry point, main, if you will, is going to run using a single task executing on locale zero. So all chapel programs start out as serial programs running on a single locale, and then various features will cause them to spread out to other locales as it executes, which we'll see in a sec. All right, so let's look at another example. This is a very simple task parallel way to say hello world. But rather than saying it once, we're going to say it a bunch of times from a bunch of tasks, more or less simultaneously. Um, the first thing we're going to do here is point out that we have some features built into the language that let you reason about the system resources you're running on. And one of them is this identifier here. This is a built-in uh, variable you can think of it as being, which refers to the locale on which I'm currently running. So I use this to say, hey, what is the number of processing units, or PUs, or, or cores, if you will, that this locale has? How many things can I run simultaneously, essentially? And I'm going to store that into a, very, or into a constant called num tasks. Basically, how many tasks might I want to run on this locale? And the other place you see here, here, is in my little hello world message. I'm saying here.name, which is a way of querying what's the unique, you can think of it as like the host name, uh, basically a unique name for my locale. What am I called as a locale? So the next thing we're going to see is this loop called a coforall. This is a way of introducing task parallelism into a program. So it's a lot like the for loop we saw before, but where the for loop was a serial loop that it executed its iterations one at a time, the coforall is a task parallel concept. It's going to create a distinct task for each of its iterations. And so each of those tasks has its own copy of the loop body that it, it is executing. And then once all those tasks complete, the program will move on. So in this case, because I'm counting from one to num tasks, I'm basically looping a number of times equal to the number of processing units or cores on this locale. And in the little dialog box at the bottom, assume I'm running on a two core system. That query is going to come back with two as the number of tasks. So I'm going to iterate through this loop two times, creating a separate task for each iteration. And each of those tasks is going to execute the loop body simultaneously. So because they're not doing anything to synchronize or coordinate with one another, uh, those two messages may come out in either order. And you can see in this run, task two happened to print first before task one. 
But if I ran it multiple times, I might see those messages come out in either order. And if you ran on a higher core count machine, you'd see the mess a lot more messages and have them come out in a much more arbitrary order. Now this program, as I've written it, is a shared memory program. None of the code has referred to other locales, either explicitly or implicitly. And as a result, I'm never going to leave locale zero, which again is where programs start running. But with a simple change to it, I can make it into a distributed memory program. So let me show you the code I've just added here. The first thing is this uh, variable called locales. This is another built-in variable. And this is an array that represents the array of locales on which our program is running. So if I ran on 1,000 locales, or 1,000 compute nodes, if you will, this array would have 1,000 elements in it. Here in my example, I'm running on two locales, let's say. So I'll have just two elements in it, representing the two compute nodes my program is running on. Now I'm using another coforall to iterate over that locales array. So what this means is I'm going to create a task for every locale that we're running on. If I'm running on two locales, I'm creating two tasks. If I'm running on 1,000 locales, I'm creating 1,000 tasks. The next statement allows us to control the locality or the affinity of these tasks. So again, each of the tasks I create has its own copy of, of the loop body it's executing. And this on clause says, migrate yourself to the locale represented by loc. So the first iteration it has locale zero, it's gonna go to locale zero. Second iteration corresponds to locale one, it's gonna move itself over to locale one. And at this point, I essentially have one task running for each of my compute nodes essentially doing an SPMD style of parallelism. Now from there, the computation proceeds as before. Each task goes in and queries, how many cores are there on my compute node? And then let me create a task for each one of their cores, those cores, and it's gonna print out this little message. So basically with this simply doubly nested loop in this on clause, we've essentially created a task for every single core across every compute node that we're running on, potentially across the entire system, each of which is printing its own little hello world message which is both identi uniquely identifying its task ID and the name of the locale on which it's running. Okay, um, so that is a very simple distributed memory program in Chapel. And again, this is a complete program. You could type this into your favorite Emacs or Vim or whatever buffer, save it, compile it, run it, and you could run on as many cores as you have available to you. Now, as with the base language, there's some other task parallel features, but you've actually seen uh, a good chunk of them. There are a couple of other ways of creating tasks, begin and co-begin. There's some ways of having tasks uh, share data or synchronize with one another. We do that through variables called atomic variables or synchronized variables. There are two different flavors there. And we also have task intense or task private variables, which are ways of having tasks refer to variables in ways that are safe or sufficiently private that they don't stomp on each other's feet. But really that's about it for the task parallel features. Um, it's, it's a small subset of the language, but very powerful. So next we're gonna to move to the high level features in Chapel. Um, and here we're gonna be focusing primarily on data parallels and we'll, we'll touch briefly on domain maps, which we saw at the very beginning of the talk as well. And again, um, this is a high level features language and this is really where we hope a lot of programmers will spend their time programming because it's really where a lot of the productivity comes in. All right, so this is again a complete program. It's a very simple one. Basically what we're gonna do is um, declare an array and then populate that array in parallel. And again, I'll walk you through it bit by bit. The first line here declares a configuration constant, which we've seen before. So this is like our problem size. And I've defaulted it to 1,000, but in my little um, pretend shell at the bottom, you can see I've overridden that default using n equals five, just so I have something small enough I can print it out. The first piece of new code that you're seeing here, or new kind of code, is the declaration of this variable d. Um, d here is what we call a domain, or uh, you can think of it as a first class concept representing an index set. And when I'm initializing this domain D to the index set one to N comma one to N. And you can think of this as like a big square N squared, almost like an array. It's an N by N set of indices, but it's not like an array in the sense that there's not any uh, memory or data elements associated with each of those indices. It's just like this N squared set of indices um, from one one to N N. Now the next line actually declares an array. And in Chapel, you declare an array over a domain. So here I'm saying variable A uh, should be declared over all the indices described by domain D. And for each of those indices, allocate a real, which is a real floating point value in Chapel. We also have imaginaries. So at this point, I've changed that n by n set of indices into an n by n array. And I actually have n squared data now, n squared floating point values essentially stored in memory. 
Now the next line shows how I can compute on that array. What I'm gonna use is a for all loop. And this is the third loop we've seen today. It's also a parallel loop like the co for all, but here's how it differs. The co for all literally creates a distinct task for every single iteration. But if we ran this program at our default problem size of a thousand, we'd have a million iterations of this loop. And creating a million tasks simply to do an update to one uh, array, array location, which is what we're doing in the body of the loop here, is probably a case of over decomposition. Probably we're gonna spend more time creating and destroying tasks than actually have them co compute. So a co for all probably isn't appropriate here. And instead what we're gonna use is a for all loop. And the for all loop says, use an appropriate amount of parallelism to implement this loop, where the appropriate amount is actually determined in this case by the domain D. And what it's actually going to do is it's gonna say, well, let me see how many cores there are on this locale. And let's say it's four. I'm gonna chunk those uh, iterations in D up across those four locales so that each owns a quarter of them. And then we only create four tasks and each one's gonna have a big serial block of data to do. Um, you can see in the body loop here, I'm basically just assigning a sub i j, a simple function of i and j, just to give each array element a unique value. Okay. And then at the end, I print out the array so you can see what those values are. All right, so again, this is an example of a shared memory program in Chapel. I haven't done anything here to refer to remote locales, again, either explicitly or implicitly. There are no on clauses, which you know, we saw in our previous example. And so again, I'm only gonna run this on locale zero. And that for all loop is only gonna use the cores that are available in loc locale zero. But as with our previous example, I can make some pretty simple changes to this code and turn it into a distributed memory program. And this gets back to actually the first stream example that we saw at the beginning of the talk. So what I'm gonna do is put in uh, at the top of the program, use cyclic dist, which brings in a module that's part of our standard set of modules. Um, this one implements a cyclic distribution. And then I've changed that declaration of D uh, where the pointer's pointing to implement this or to insert this D mapped clause. I'm saying map this domain down to the locales in my program using a cyclic distribution starting at index one one. And what that's gonna do is essentially deal out the indices of the domain in a round robin fashion across all of my locales. And from that point on, the rest of the code just inherits that distributed nature. So because I've declared, I've distributed D, and then because I've declared array A over D, um, A is similarly distributed over all my compute nodes, over all my locales. And because the for all loop is over D, all of its iterations are gonna be distributed across the locales as well. So where before I was only using the cores of locale zero to run this loop, now I'm gonna be using the cores of all the locales on which I ran my program. So again, a very simple change to the declaration, and I haven't had to change any of the quote unquote science of my program, the actual computational part. It's just inherited that new domain map, and it's changed from a shared memory program into a distributed memory program, as we saw with stream at the beginning of the talk. All right, and that's a quick introduction to data parallelism in Chapel. As with the other sections, um, there are a lot of other data parallel features that we're not gonna see here. Um, there are ways to write your own parallel iterators and you can do zippering like we saw in the serial case. You can slice and dice arrays uh, to refer to subarrays using ranges and domains to index into them. Uh, you can promote scalar functions using array arguments so that they execute in parallel and produce array results. You can compute reductions and scans on arrays. Um, and I should also point out, we've only seen dense arrays in the example I showed here but Chapel also has strided domains and arrays, sparse domains and arrays, and associative domains and arrays where you can index into the arrays using arbitrary values. In this example, strings, for example. Uh, so again, lots more features here. This is again, one of the rich parts of the language. There are a lot of data parallel features, um, but we're not gonna have time to get into those today. In fact, what we're gonna do at this point is just summarize and point you to some resources that you can use on your own time to learn more about Chapel. Uh, so the first thing I wanna say to summarize is that we believe that Chapel cleanly and orthogonally supports the expression of parallelism and locality, as well as how to map computations down to the system. And we've seen some examples of this, even in these very simple benchmarks and illustrative examples that we've seen in the talk today. Secondly, I wanna say that Chapel is powerful, as I hope you uh, have seen and believe. Chapel supports very succinct and straightforward code, yet code that can result in performance that competes with, or in some cases beats, standard ways of programming parallel systems, such as C plus MPI plus OpenMP, which is kind of the de facto standard for high performance computing. And lastly, I'll say that Chapel is attractive to computational scientists and particularly to Python programmers. Even though Chapel is not Python, it has a similar sensibility that a lot of Python programmers find attractive. 
And again, uh, we've shown some of this through some of the examples of projects that are powered by Chapel earlier in the talk. So at this point, I wanna point out some resources you can use to learn more about Chapel. The one thing you should really know about is the Chapel homepage. From here, you can get to any of these other resources that I'm gonna to refer to today. Um, so this is kind of the centralized place to get anything about Chapel. You can download the release here. You can look at presentations like this one, read papers, look for resources, read online documentation. Speaking of online documentation, um, our documentation is online. It's at chapelang.org slash docs, or you can get to it from the sidebar at the main page as well. And at this point, it's about 270 web pages of documentation, including some very nice introductory primer examples, which is a good way to learn the language. Um, this number is growing with every release, and the documentation just gets better and better over time. Um, we're pretty active on social media. We have a Twitter account and a Facebook account that we post to sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, sometimes little lags get in. Um, you're welcome to follow us there or peek in on us there without even having an account. We also have a YouTube page. Um, we don't update that nearly as often, but whenever we have a good video, um, we try to post that up on the YouTube page so that people can look at it and enjoy it. Um, we have a pretty strong community presence. We maintain a chapel tag on Stack Overflow, and any questions that are asked there with the chapel tag, we try to jump on and answer as quickly as possible. We also have a, uh, an issues page on our GitHub repository, and this is one of the main ways that community members will fire bug reports or feature requests. And then we on Workdays tend to sit all day on Gitter, which is an online chat capability. Uh, so that's a way to interact directly with the team, uh, ask questions that are maybe um, kind of just quick and dirty questions that just need a quick answer, as opposed to something maybe um, that's more worthy of archiving in Stack Overflow or uh, elevating as an issue in GitHub, for example. And then last I wanna mention, we have a Chapel announced mailing list. It doesn't have really high volume, it's maybe about 15 mails per year, but it's a good way to learn about Chapel events that are coming up like CHU or things we're doing at Supercomputing or at other conferences. Um, next, I'm gonna to turn to some suggested reading. If you wanna learn more about the history and motivating themes and features of Chapel, including some of the examples we've seen today, um, there's a chapter in this book called uh, Programming Models for Parallel Computing that's a really good place to start. And I'd encourage you to buy the book, it's a great book, but you can also read the chapel for free online. Um, there's a link here in the slides. Uh, there was a period where we wrote a paper a couple years ago now, and that's a good way to learn about progress that happened in the five years following that book chapter being written. So if you kind of want to walk through the history of the project, uh, this would be sort of the next step in that. And you can look at either the paper or the slides for this. This is presented at CUG, which is the Cray Users Group in 2018. And then at any point, if you want to learn kind of what is the latest and greatest that's been going on with Chapel in terms of the implementation and the releases, we maintain a set of release notes on our project page. Uh, so the, the current ones are for our most recent releases that came out, Chapel 121 and 122. Um, and you can read about various improvements that were done in terms of the language or the library or interoperability, benchmarks or performance improvements. And you can also see what we're planning on working on for the next release. So again, to summarize, um, we think Chapel is a great language. Uh, more and more, uh, we think other users are, are thinking the same thing. We hope that you uh, take a look at Chapel, check it out, uh, enjoy what we see, and let us know if you see things that you think ought to be improved or cases that you need help with. We're always happy to help people, happy to help people out with it. So thanks very much. <laughs>